begin our worship on this Lord's Day with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. You can remain seated for this. <clears throat> Blessed is the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves, and we rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear the difference and do not welcome others as we welcome us. We sin in thought, word, and by your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live to serve you in the midst of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace, our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also we'll now pray together our prayer of the day. Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to live with you and love you as we love you. Grant us your mercy and your grace that we may be the people of your love. Now hear our first Bible reading. <clears throat> our first lesson is from Isaiah, the 56th chapter. The prophet calls upon Israel to do justice in view of God's imminent intervention to save. Righteousness and obedience define who belongs to the Israelite community, not race, <clears throat> nationality, or any other category. Thus says the Lord, Maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come, and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer." Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those who already those already gathered. Here ends the first lesson. Yes, our psalmody today is Psalm 67, reading responsively. May God be merciful to us and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Let your way be known on earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for your glory. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations. Let people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its increase. O God, our own God, has blessed us. May God give us blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. Here ends the psalmody. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes from the 11th chapter of Romans. God has not rejected Israel. Rather, the call and gifts of God are irrevocable, 
so that while all have been disobedient, God has mercy upon all. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Here ends the second lesson. As you're able, you may rise. <laughs> the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Uh, partly because my sermon is focusing on the second part of this Gospel, and partly because it's hot and I don't want to belabor things too long. Uh, we're going to skip to verse 21 of our Gospel, so I'm going to just read the last part of the Gospel, but feel free to take this bulletin home with you and uh, read the whole thing at home for your, your own edification. But my sermon is going to focus on the second part, starting in verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then... A Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, and our hymn of the day is Be Thou My Vision.
Good morning. Good morning. You know, try as we might, we do not always find ourselves comfortable among people we don't really know, especially within our very diverse country, we find religious, ethnic, cultural, and social distinctives that can challenge even the most adaptable of us. And traveling away from home in a normal non-COVID year, of course, particularly if we stray outside of the usual tourist bubbles, we can find ourselves lost among people whose sensibilities and lifestyles are very different from our own. And I am reminded, and I know I bring this up a lot, but it was a very uh, important visit for me to the Holy Land of Israel twice in my lifetime so far. And one interesting uh, aspect of that was that in the Middle East, and it doesn't matter if you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim or whatever, <clears throat> in the Middle East, men do not wear shorts. It's, it, yeah, exactly. Whereas in our culture, we wear shorts all the time, right? But in the Middle East, it doesn't matter your religion or your ethnicity. Uh, grown men simply do not wear shorts. They look at it as children's clothes. And so when a grown man wears shorts to the Middle Eastern mentality, that's kind of a silly thing. Okay, that's something just reserved for kids. So, of course, though, for the tourists that come to the Holy Land of Israel, they make allowances. And so you see people wearing shorts, except if you go into a church or into a, a holy place of any kind, uh, a, a mosque or uh, a um, synagogue or a church, as I said, you have to be wearing pants. And so what several of us did was we got those pants that you could zip at the knee. Have you seen those before? And uh, so we would wear shorts everywhere, but basically when we went into, say, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the empty tomb church, uh, the most holiest place in Christianity, we zipped our pant legs on and we were set. So we know how that is to be in a setting that's very different. And in our Gospel reading today, it tells a story about Jesus traveling to the land of Tyre and Sidon, as it says which is a coastal area of the ancient Canaanite territory of the Phoenicians. So this is Phoenicia, which interestingly is modern-day Lebanon. And we've been seeing Lebanon in the news tragically recently. So basically, Jesus and his disciples left home for a visit to the Mediterranean Sea. In other words, Jesus took a trip to the beach. And it is interesting to think that even our Lord and Savior would take time out uh, to do some traveling. But it wasn't just any beach, of course. It was a beach in a nearby foreign country. He basically left Jewish territory and went on a trip in a non-Jewish land. And there was a long-standing feud between the Hebrews of the land of Israel and the Canaanites of the land of Tyre and Sidon. And Jesus is approached by a local Canaanite woman, it says, who wants him to heal her daughter. But the Jews called such Canaanite people a derogatory name. They called them dogs. Did you notice that in the Gospel reading? Jesus refers to her and her people as dogs. In fact, the word dog was used as an ethnic and racial slur. And we have to remember that dogs, or canines, didn't enjoy the privileged place back then as they do today. Uh, we're dog lovers, as many of you know, but that wasn't always universally the case. Although interestingly, I'd say cats were held in high regard uh, in ancient times in, in Egypt and in Israel. Uh, does anyone want to guess why that is, why cats were held in such high regard? Go ahead. Right, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to take a stab at it? Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Uh, to keep down the vermin. Yeah, rodent control. Mm. And especially for the crops, right? For the growing of the crops in the fields, and then especially when they would harvest and store the grain. So cats were seen as uh, an agent of the divine 
to uh, care for that all-important thing, which was the grain for the food for the people. But anyway, dogs did not hold that high uh, a place. So it's obvious then that this woman was desperate because she would have been brought up to despise the Jews, just as the Jews would have been brought up to despise the Canaanites. So she risked being insulted and rebuffed by this group of Jewish men traveling to the sea. But her immediate need, her overwhelming need to find healing for her daughter overcame all of her fear and prejudice and bigotry. So Jesus decided to use this as a teaching moment for everyone all around him. He decides to test the boundaries of the Jewish and Canaanite cultures with the example of this woman seeking healing for her daughter. He decides to test the boundaries of these cultures by using that ancient racial slur of dog in order to deal with the shared bigotry of both the Jews and the Canaanites together. He says, we don't give dogs human food, very harshly said to her. And by saying this, Jesus speaks aloud what his disciples, his fellow Jews, were probably thinking about this Canaanite woman. He speaks out loud what they were feeling in their hearts about her. And by doing so, he takes on their cultural bigotry by calling it out into the open. Do you see what he's doing there? You could just imagine his disciples' red faces as he speaks this racial slur out loud right to this woman's face. The disciples were all thinking it, but Jesus actually said it, bringing it out into the light of day and exposing it. You can just imagine them thinking, Lord Jesus, we, we're thinking this about this gal, but how could you say that? So in this way, Jesus uses this woman to embarrass and shame those around him who had been carrying such prejudice and bigotry within their hearts on both sides of the Canaanite-Israelite boundary. He was challenging everyone. Jesus is putting these boundaries to the test. And therefore, he is testing the faith of both his disciples and the Canaanite woman together. So the question is, would this woman and the disciples, by the way, step through their pride and prejudice and embrace a race-transcending and culture-crossing faith? Well, yes, this woman does, in fact, do that. By pointing out that even dogs get the scraps that fall from the table, she expresses a great, all-encompassing kind of faith that transcends all differences between people. A faith that can leave behind her own prejudice and bigotry, which is what Jesus was after all along. So Jesus praises her faith, her example of faith, by saying, woman, great is your faith. And because of her inclusive, transcendent faith, healing was thereby made available. You know, brothers and sisters, all too often our prayers are safe. They are prayers at a distance. They cost us very little. And I include myself in that. We risk nothing when we say, God bless you, or God bless so-and-so. There's no real risk there. It's important to do that, but it's also important to follow that up. When Jesus says, follow me, he invites us out of our comfort zones, out of our safety. He invites us to seek understanding with those very different from us. It's very important that we try to seek understanding. He invites us to reach out to those who may be called dogs within our society, those seen as marginal or even worthless. Jesus and the woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon met each other from different cultural, religious, and ethnic backgrounds. They met, they exchanged some barbed words at first, 
But then healing came out of that encounter. Healing came out of that cross-cultural engagement. Each and every week, we gather together from different walks of life. Each and every week, at the Lord's table, Jesus feeds us with much more than mere crumbs and scraps from His holy table. We receive His grace and empowerment here. Grace and empowerment for a life of inclusive faith and hope in Him. Every week at worship, through word and sacrament, and through song and fellowship, God empowers and strengthens us to live our lives according to God's law and gospel. To live our lives according to His inclusive righteousness and all-encompassing grace, regardless of differences. By the power of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, may we dare to be a people of great faith, just like Jesus referred to that Canaanite woman's faith in our Gospel reading. By God's grace, may we be open to a great faith that transcends prejudices and discriminations. May we be a grace-filled, spirit-led, and reconciling people of Christ, people of a great transcendent faith in God, for God's glory, and for our benefit and the healing of all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll now, in response to the good news of Christ that we've heard this day, confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can remain seated. What do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who is conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered and the crimes of Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, you gather the church to be part of your mission as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As Jesus acknowledged the great faith of a woman from outside his people, help your church discover and find blessing in the faith of people we might reject. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have blessed us with the bounty of the earth, Grant your grace to all your creatures, that the earth will flourish. Relieve waters choked by garbage, renew soils stripped of nutrients, and refresh the air all creatures need to live. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You call the nations to be glad and sing for joy. Let your way be known among all the nations of the world now divided by competing ideologies and contending alliances. Bless us and make your face shine upon all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of insight, we pray for all our partners in mission. Bailey Human Care, Food and Clothing Ministry, Door of Hope Ministry for Homeless Families, Fred Jordan Missions for the Homeless, Walter Hoving Home Women's Shelter Ministry, Linda Gawthorne of Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Kogi People, Pastor Jack and the VRIM Korean Presbyterian Church, our Scout Pack 307, Bishop Guy and our Southwest California Synod, and Presiding Bishop Elizabeth and our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
you show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. We pray for those who do not have enough, for outcasts in our villages, cities, and towns, and for those who need your healing. We especially pray for Eugene, which is uh, Kenny Kurtz's uncle who has passed away now and has gone to be with the Lord. We pray for Kenny's cousin who is experiencing this great loss, his cousin Kirk. We pray for Flo, Ron Tallickson's grandmother, or mother, I should say. We pray for Brandon and Shannon and Philip, Kim, Kay Coates and family, Judy, Marguerite, Eulalia, Sigrid, Chad, Kenny, Carl, Carrie, Randy, Ruth, Luna Joy, Haley, Chuck, Nanette, Dee, John, Sam, Ruth, Jane, Dwayne, Ellen, Dave, Margaret, Ben, Tyler, and all of our men and women in military service, law enforcement, veterans, and all of our family members and friends who are on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you we live and move and have our being. Grant our congregation grace to find our life refreshed in you. Accompany us in the rhythms of late summer. Give us rest and renewal and strengthen us for mission in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your eternal promises are more than we could ever imagine. As you gather all the saints, join us also with them at the great day of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. As you're able, you may rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and pray. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread of life and drink this cup of salvation, we proclaim the Lord's sacrificial death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. As we've already received our offerings when we were coming in to worship this morning, we'll now pray together our offertory prayer. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are the signs of your love and your mercy. Nourish us through these gifts, that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray daily the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trust us against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated, and the ushers will uh, dismiss you in an orderly fashion to receive Holy Communion.